Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Scott Steen, CEO of American Forests. American Forests is the country's oldest national nonprofit conservation organization that advocates for the protection and expansion of U.S. forests. Scott has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Scott, for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. American forests in this age of global warming, of deforestation, of, of uh, real threats to our environment as our economy also is suffering its own stresses. Um, it's, it's such a important area. This is a country of forests. Uh, talk about the, the mission uh, of, the, uh, of American forests. When everyone's talking about um, the environment, clean air, clean water, um, global warming, uh, and habitat for animals, they all come back to forests. Having healthy forests is absolutely um, tantamount to having a healthy environment. So at American Forest, our job really is to um, both protect and restore um, our nation's forests. Now we've worked in all 50 states and 38 countries as well, but our, our focus really is primarily here in the U.S. Talk about how forests have, have evolved in, in this nation. Well, well, interestingly, we were founded in 1875 before there really was a conservation movement, before people were talking about the environment, by a group of folks who had tremendous foresight. And they saw that we were slowly clear-cutting our way across the country. And, and, it, and the mentality was, this is a resource that will last forever. There was always sort of this divide between John Muir, mm -hmm. um, who was the great sort of visionary founder of a park system, and who was a preservationist who wanted nothing ever change. That was sort of, this should be protected forever. Right. Uh, and, and Pinchot, who said, we need to figure out how to manage this responsibly so that it gives, um, that we get the long-term benefit that all, um, all life can enjoy the benefits of, of forest, but also that it is used in a responsible way. And I think we've always come down more on that side of things. How do we make sure that we are using the resources we have in a responsible way? It's amazing how many different organizations and the wide diversity of people in different regions uh, that are involved in the preservation of the forests and of of trying to sustain those forest ecosystems all across the country. It, it is. I mean, I think there are a tremendous number of groups who are involved. But you, you think of the amazing innovation. And we talk about what the economy is like now and the challenges that we have. And this, the Citizens Conservation Corps came out of the worst economic time in the country. And there was the foresight to say, what if we use this opportunity to take care of, um, to take care of our um, our environment, to take care of um, this amazing gift that we've been given. One of the things that that um, we've seen in the development of forests throughout the world is the development of of what is called in Scandinavia the grand boring forest. It's tree after tree of of a particular species. Uh, uh, forests that are planted in, in nice sort of discrete rows, sort of like, like corn is grown. There's very little, um, there is an ecosystem, everything has an ecosystem, but there's very little uh, diversity in the ecosystem. The monoculture forests. The monoculture fo forests. Is that the danger of our fate if, if we do not cultivate our forests in, in, in the way to, to create these full ecosystems? It's certainly a danger. I mean, it's a big danger. We will have forests, but we may have forests completely populated with tree of heaven in the Northeast right. and with, in, with invasives. You can, uh, I think our challenge is really um, to, to help create these diverse um, forests that are able to sustain all sorts of life. So it isn't the existence of forests, it's the type of forest that you are uh, trying to cultivate. It's definitely the right tree in the right place. It can't, uh, the idea of just sort of going in and planting um, one kind of tree. We're, we're dealing with a, um, an issue in the Mountain West right now um, where we're trying 
to I mean, fighting all sorts of, um, of things, like climate change, but also um, an, the, the pine bark beetle and um, right. a disease called blister rust, which isn't invasive, and that um, are killing white bark pine. Now, white bark pine, it's one tree, but it's a tree that basically sustains the biodiversity of the whole system. So, so we're really looking at, we could have a, basically a, 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 f a fairly monoculture ecosystem develop pretty quickly if that one tree suddenly goes away because it sustains so many other, um, other plants and animals in that ecosystem. And even if you're, you're living distant from, from uh, a forest in a New York or a Washington, in a, um, in a Houston or in a uh, Los Angeles, is this the kind of, of event, the, the diminution of our forests, that actually threatens us in a material way? 60% of the water that we drink in the U.S. comes from forests. 60% 60 of the water. 60%. Think of, of pretty much half of the air we breathe comes from forests. And whether you're in a city or in, in the country, that's, that fact remains. But, but forests are something we think of as out there, of being far away. And you know, it's, you live in the city, and, and what, 80, 85% of us live in cities now, and, or in, in metropolitan areas. And forests are something that you think of as wilderness, as being outside of where you live. And I think part of our challenge is, one, to say many cities are forested ecosystems, that forest is in the city. And as well, those, those forests that are wilderness, that are out there, have enormous impact on your life no matter where you live. So I, I think that's actually one of our great challenges, is, is to connect people who may never visit a forest and to the idea that they're absolutely dependent on the health of forests. Although we are increasingly distant from a life surrounded by forests, in many respects, we are still living a life that is surrounded and directly impacted by the forests in our country. No forests, no life. I mean, that's sort of, um, that's the reality. We really want to help people begin to understand that there is, that they live in an ecosystem and that they are part of an ecosystem and, and that, um, diverse um, mixed forests and are part of every great city. In terms of how the organization works, describe your organization and the various programs that you uh, advance. We're actually making grants to local on-the-ground organizations who really understand the ecosystem or we're working with large partners like the U.S. Forest Service or the Park Service to um, restore specific forests. You're engaged in reforestation. Yes and you are engaged in the shaping of ecosystems that have been knocked out of alignment with their natural uh, development. Forests are, go through cycles and they naturally regenerate. And climate change and invasives and, and uh, explosive um, sort of infestations of, of particular insects have changed and, and the intensity of forest fires um, and these sort of mega fires that we're having now all of that has really changed the game. And so um, we're doing a whole lot more restoration tree planting. Um, and I think we're doing it to restore um, habitat for specific mm -hmm. animals. We're doing it to, um, to strengthen um, watersheds. We're doing it to provide riparian buffers um, around rivers and streams. We're doing it for a whole host of reasons. Reasons. I think um, we're also working um, to, and we have a project in California that um, we're funding where an entire state park um, basically burned to the ground. And normally park systems, parks in particular, tend to never replant. They got no regeneration. It burned so in intensely. intensely. That, that nothing grew back. Well, actually, no trees grew Sterilized back. Sterilized the ground. Uh, and right. It did. And um, it burned so hot that birds fell out of the sky. Uh, and it, it was an amazing fire. And it's something that really is an experiment for us. We're, um, we're working in that instance um, as um, 
with climate, with carbon credits, with mm -hmm. um, and also bring together Cal Fire, the the Forest Service out in California, the park system, right. a lot of different partners um, to do that kind of work. So that so that's really the first um, major thing that I think has defined American forests over the last 20 or 25 years. So in years. many respects, in that particular case, you're recreating a park that has been destroyed. We are. And, and we see it as much more than a park. We see it really as, as a vital ecosystem. And it has the, the side benefit of providing great um, sustainable recreational opportunities. But it's, it is also habitat. It is also protecting watershed. It is also um, providing um, clean air. It provides carbon sequestration, all of the great benefits of forests. So, and it is, it's something that hasn't really been done. You're really restoring from the ground up. And that's, it's an unusual project for us even. And you know, normally, I mean, we're planting trees. Um, we're working with groups in the lower Rio Grande mm -hmm. to actually restore what was at one time the most biologically diverse area of the country. And and 95% of it was converted to agriculture right. and really doing enormous ecological damage. And we are, we've planted 1.5 million trees so far in that, um, in that area. In that area. So those are the kind of projects we're doing. We're also um, really focusing on urban forests. Uh, and, and we're about to introduce a program called Community Relief, R-E-L-E-A-F. That's our kind of brand for all of these. Um, uh, restoration projects, where we're working with cities to assess needs around things like um, stormwater runoff mm -hmm. and um, environmental justice. Do poor areas have have trees um, in the same ways or parks in the same ways that wealthier neighborhoods have them? But to really do the assessment, sort of do using technology, kind of map canopy, mm -hmm. um, map where density is, and then uh, providing grants for tree planting and maintenance. And in cities, what we find is mayors will show up to a tree planting, but no mayor shows up to a, to a tree pruning. You know, the, <laughs> the, the, the long-term maintenance of, of um, city trees and the urban forest is a much harder sell to, um, to funders, to the, the city government. But healthy urban forests save cities money in all sorts of ways it also creates healthier and happier citizens. What strikes me is the, is the symmetricality between the harvesting and the planting. The, um, the exploitation, not in any bad sense. We use wood products. Mm -hmm. We use wood products for building. We use wood products for furniture. Uh, so the exploitation of a resource and the, um, the safeguarding of ecosystems. Um, the amount of effort, coordination, business savvy, organizational skill, financing to preserve, protect, and extend forest ecosystems is very analogous to the amount of business savvy, resource, engagement, effort to harvest it the results are different and the return on the investment is just as tangible, isn't it? It is very tangible, although um, it's a harder sell. I mean, you're selling a, pro when you sell a table, you're selling a product. And you're, and you're, selling and a you're providing individual profit to an investor or to um, a wage earner. But, exactly, and, and I think one of my, I have been in this position for two years. It's, um, it's not where I've been most of my career. And, realizing the difference. Tree time is a very different, for the time of forests and of where the payoff happens is very different than almost anything else. You're talking about a much longer investment. And to restore a forest, you're seeing results in 25 years, 50 years. And so it requires a difference in, in human perception. When you cut down a tree and you convert it into a product, you get the benefit instantaneously. It happens you, much more quickly. You get the table to actually grow the tree, even at 10 feet a year, which is, uh, I guess, the, the growth rate of, of, of redwoods. Um, 
you have to wait. You have to wait 50 years, even 100 years, mm -hmm. to get to where that redwood has that stature to support the ecosystem that it is capable of supporting. I mean, these, these white bark pines that we're looking at in the mountain west that are so critical to this ecosystem, many of them are 500, 1,000 years old. Uh, and, and they are provide the mature ones, the big ones, are what provide the greatest environmental and ecological benefit. So, I mean, it is, it's a long-term investment. I mean, for, for those trees, they don't start bearing cones for, until they're 25 years old. Right. And so it, it, it is sort of looking at things very differently. And I think part of our job, part of my job, is to convince people that this is an investment that we have to make, that's worth making, even though it's not going to pay off for a while. Are you seeing a shift in, in the sensibility of the American public um, toward um, uh, American forests? Actually, even if you look at the polls of what um, if people are saying that they one believe in climate change and believe in um, that it has human causes, it swung much more toward the science. A friend of mine runs the American Geophysical Union, which is all the earth scientists. And she said, there's absolutely no debate in the people who actually do this work. Climate change in the scientific community is, is not a debate. And it's, it's a given. And, and man-made causes, human, human impacts on climate change are not a debate. There are real impacts that only now are being addressed through the reforestation that has been going on for the last 50 years. I think it's getting to a point where we have we can't ignore it anymore. It's really in, in our faces. And I think what's happening in forests is, um, I mean, it's, the climate change is the single most um, important threat to forests right now. How will American forests, do you feel, adjust over the next 10 years, given the realities that you were just describing? I think our work now is more important than perhaps it ever has been. So I think we are in the process of rethinking how do we adapt to the changes that are happening now and happening not in, you know, we talk about right. tree time or forest time. They're not happening in that time anymore. They're happening much, much more quickly. So I think a lot of our protection efforts are really around education. So you're talking about changes in uh, upgrading your educational outreach. You're talking about changes in upgrading your marketing communication uh, outreach you are talking about the evolution of your programs to meet the differing needs of forest ecosystems, not just in, in planting trees and perhaps preserving, but creating a, a, a wider range of skills. You're talking about more sophisticated partnerships with other organizations that, whose uh, missions are aligned to yours. That all requires funding and financing, and as you grow, uh, your, your requirements, your operational requirements, and your financial management requirements will grow. And then, of course, the governance uh, will shift. You're talking about a really um, uh, impressive list of to-dos over the next uh, years of your tenure. We have a very ambitious agenda. Of, um, the need is, is enormous, uh, but I think we're going to have to do the work in a very different way than what we've done in the past. And what I'm actually leaving from this meeting and going out to meet with one of my board members who is the drummer from Lincoln Park, the band. Mm -hmm. and not a conventional board choice, but one of the things we want to do is be able to really start engaging younger people um, in this work. We need to find new ways to bring this message to a, a new generation of people. And, and I think you, figuring out how we use social media more effectively, how we communicate um, to young people in a way that engages them. I think all philanthropic organizations have this challenge of, of reaching, um, I think, not um, a more cynical, but much more sophisticated audience. Oh, yes. And I, I think young people today are very smart about how they choose what they want to be involved in. And, and so we have to find a way to really um, engage those, um, that generation on their terms in a way that really um, makes them see how important this work is. 
Well, Scott Steen, thank you so much for sharing the work of American Forests with us. And thank you so much for your insights. My pleasure. Thank you.